I don't live in your world. How does a script like this come to you? Is it something you sought out? Is it something that somebody introduced you? How does, give me an idea of the way Hollywood works. And then how did you get locked into it? Sadly, a script like this doesn't ever come your way. I have stories that I created, many of which deal with black culture, my experience um, in those worlds, uh, some that were actually brought to me. And 99.9% .9 of the time in my whole career, you are basically told that, you know, uh, basically black stories don't travel internationally and therefore they can't get financed and you're not gonna be able to make that movie. And it's a very, very sad tale that's told over and over again. And it's an uphill battle that I've been fighting for a very, very long time. Things are slowly beginning to change now due to larger social movements and Black Lives Matter and a requirement that's becoming on Hollywood to pay attention um, and to deal with these things. But the reality is, uh, I, I think as we both know, change takes time and we're very far from change. Uh, I think that was obviously the larger point in, you know, the, you know, the three guilty verdicts for Derek Chauvin, just saying, you know, this is a step in the right direction. This doesn't resolve the larger problems. Um, and, and unfortunately, that does apply in many ways to Hollywood. Hollywood is a business. Hollywood is about making money and exploitation of these things. And um, it's a little bit of if you build it, you know, it'll come kind of thing. And the requirement was I kept trying to get this property. Now, the interesting thing, and I never really thought about it in this perspective, but the book is written by a white male and a prominent white investigative journalist. It is told through the perspective of this white male. I never saw it as this white savior story by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but the reality is the book was prominent. The story was prominent. And I think there was, there was definitely a lot of people trying to get their hands on it to make it. Um, for me, and I'll tie this into the Lincoln lawyer for you, I have had a very unique history of trying to figure out, because I didn't understand with art and making things, how much of like your own maturation and where you are and the marriage of the two sort of begin to define who, who you are and what you make and how the world sees you. So for example, when I went to make The Lincoln Lawyer, I was, I was very young and um, I was in my early 30s and for me, the role of Earl, played by Lawrence Mason, the driver, uh, it was a very crucial element to the movie because Earl had his ear to the streets. Earl was the one listening to the 90s hip hops, Gangstar, and, and as a result of that, um, you know, I, I had, by the way, I have this, I have to find a way to get this because I have a scene in that movie where I have McConaughey in the car rapping to the Ghetto Boys. And, <laughs> and it, oh yeah, and it, it's it, it's a lot. It's the scene that I was like, if I could get, if I could put in a movie where I have McConaughey, you know, <laughs> rapping to this, like it will blow your mind. Because he says, like, you know, my hands are all bloody from punching on the concrete. Like when you're watching Matthew do that verse, I remember, like, we have to get this in the movie. But you know, things get cut, things happen. I was steadfast in my belief that the way that Mickey Holler's character learned the streets was through this really savvy street cat Earl who was giving him the information <clears throat> and using, you know, cause rap is this that, you know, hip hop is storytelling. It, it, it's, it's paying attention and watching and, you know, telling the stories of the streets. So I sort of took that, spun it through Earl to Mickey. But the sad thing about that was like, before that movie tested, and this ties into the larger question, I was told like, yo, that all that movie's coming out, all that music's coming out. Like that's not staying in the movie. And what's interesting is I was panicking and I went to the guy in charge and just said, look, can you do me a favor, please? I, 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 you know, obviously this is my first, you know, quote unquote, big movie. Can we test it with the music? And um, he was like, yeah, as long as you can test everything you want, as long as it's out by seven in the morning tomorrow, <laughs> which was his way of basically being like, it's coming out. And uh, I think that comes with the, the sort of limited understanding of like, well, we're making you know, a legal movie and, you know, in a way, respectfully, like they saw it probably in their minds as like a white movie. And these are the boxes you check in the movie. And this is how you make the movie. And, you know, having hip hop and rap, like that's not, you're going to ostracize your audience. You're not going to, like they never, there was nobody in that room 
ever from any of the people involved who understood the impact of black culture and would recognize it and understand the deeper influences of how like you don't make you know, and it changed a lot. Like uh, the NWA movie changed things because you started see it's the same concept of like, you know, certain rap albums being in the homes of white kids and like the president saying, oh, we don't want you to listen to them or this is Correct. bad music, whatever nonsense has gone on to, you know, censor this type of work. But the truth is, is I knew as a kid who had lived it, this is going to reach everyone. It's not just going to reach the black community, but it's crazy to me what I was going to say is Tyrese has been a longtime friend of mine. And I mean, a 20 year friend, we met basically when we were kids and I was, I was with, um, I was at Tyrese's house and Rev run was there. And if you now know a little bit of the era I grew up run the MC were gods. They weren't, they weren't, they were gods. Like, no, exactly. yeah. They like, I mean, uh, just from the sweatsuits to the the chains to the imagery to the raps to King of Rock, like you know, I, I there is none higher. I know every rap song they ever did. Like I'm, my brain would say I could sit here and bore you all day. Point being is I'm sitting with Rev Run, and I'm always like, you know, I still can't like put the two together. And he said to me, I heard you heard you passed on Fast and the Furious. And I said, well, it's not really that simple. I said, I just didn't feel coming in on like, this was right before Paul passed. I didn't feel coming in that they were going to like give me an opportunity to like flex my muscle as a filmmaker. I was just going to be a pawn in their game. And I had my sights set on something greater. So I didn't feel I was the right fit. And I said like, you know, I want to make art. I want to express my voice. I want to tell my stories. That's like that do the right thing thing in my head. Like, and, and, and he, he stopped me and he grabbed me. I'll never forget, he looked at me, he goes, man, you made the Lincoln lawyer. And that changed everything for me because it gave me, even though I had received a tremendous love in particular from the black community on the movie, just hearing him frame it for me as a businessman, as an intellectual, as a prominent figure in the black community, he really, it really was, I mean, he's a very powerful human being, period regardless of his success yeah. in a rap group named Run DMC. So when I had a chance to have that exchange, it was one of those meaningful moments in my life that, that educated and taught me about these things. So sadly, and I gave you a lot of information, Hollywood is just beginning to make, try to make some change in the fabric of what it's doing and hopefully we'll be seeing more of that. I don't know, like I grew up on Boomerang and Mo Money and New Jack City, like Hollywood doesn't make those movies anymore. And I can't really tell you why they were getting made at that time. And, I, and, and that's just, they probably, again, it's like everything. If one movie gets made and it makes money, then they'll make a hundred of them. But it's a very exploitive process and system. And, and you know, also you're, you're getting more and more people of prominence in the black community rising to power. So right. they're going to want to tell their own stories too. And that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. I, I, I'm just someone who in keeping truthful to myself, I want to tell the stories that I want to see. I mean, when boys in the hood came out or higher learning came out, I was, I couldn't wait for Friday night. Like Friday night was like the biggest thing ever. And I remember because I went with all my friends from the basketball team in New York city so I was like one of like two white people in the theater at the end of higher learning. I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, you know, cause I, that, that, you know, that's just rebel rousing in an incredible way. And, and it was ultimately Singleton that changed my life, which I can share that for another time. But you know, that that's basically the sad story of this and this movie in particular, um, you know, we fought, fought, fought to get it made. My friend Don Sikorsky gave me the book. He's a wonderful investigative journalist and human being. He played college ball with me at NYU. And, um, you know, eventually we got lucky. It got in my hands. Uh, and, you know, we were able to, you know, do it independent of the system and then push it through the system. You've got a Trojan horse, these things. And, and putting Johnny Depp and Forrest Whitaker in City of Lies was immensely calculated because that, what you're saying, and this will be my final piece to an, a second, barely, incredibly long answer. I was like, well, how do I reach the masses? And that was the calculation of these two heavyweights. Bring, bring Biggie's story through Johnny Depp, through Forrest Whitaker, 
right? Tell the world through them, the message will get out there. That was always my theory. It turns out, I think like to be a great marketing theory, because I don't know if I'd be here discussing it with you. Um, I don't know if I would have met Wayne and Ms. Wallace. I don't know all those things, but that was my theory that, that you needed the loudest voice in the room and they represented that. What's up guys, thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.